Oh, good. It crashed. Oh, give me an excuse. Just when you want to start all that. Oh, yeah, well, how many students do you expect? <laughs> a million? Oh, no, just the time-wise. Yeah. Yeah. As a class, how many students are right there? Hundreds. There's literally hundreds here. Full, full room. Eight. Super high attendance. Um, let's see if I. No, they actually were quite a nice attendance in Zoom as well. If you want to follow it on YouTube. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Oh, can you hear him? Probably not. Oh, hold on, yeah. Um, I think there's a way to do this. Try speaking now. Hello, hello. Uh -huh. Yeah. You're now the voice of God, Yanni. Oh. Or, or Yahweh or oh. whatever, right? Hello, class. OK. Uh, five and a bit in the afternoon, Math 2504, 2024. Uh, welcome to Unit 6. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Verbeek. Uh, Paul's been at UQ already a couple of years. Um, when we first introduced him in this course, he was fresh off the boat or the plane or maybe the quarantine because he migrated from camp. Oh, shit. I muted Yanni. Yanni, I muted you by accident, right? Just <laughs> He's not in here. Oh, there I am. Okay. <laughs> so I can... <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, keep going. Well, I was muted for the last couple of seconds, yeah. but that was all the good things about Paul. I see. Let yeah, now you can just move on to the bad stuff. Right? No, I'm joking. Look, you'll uh, really enjoy, I hope, these uh, six lecture hours with Paul Verbeek. It's kind of intense, obviously. Everybody's working towards project two. Uh, but the thing is that we've got an expert, an expert in computer algebra systems. And Paul is uh, unique in the sense that he is a teaching-focused academic in the CSSE or EECS or ITEE or uh, anyone, right. that department. Yeah. But he's actually an exceptional mathematician. So <laughs> I hope you enjoy his lectures. And uh, also make sure to use his time to ask as many questions as you can about Project, uh, project 1. Thanks a lot, Paul Verbeek. Thank okay, you, Dr. Yanni. I'll see you later. Bye. Now I may mute you. All right. Uh, excuse me. Some right. Incorporate. And pin. No, cancel. Okie dokie. Let's get rolling. We're not doing all 73 of these slides, don't worry. <laughs> Let's, let me turn down the microphones a bit. Uh, turn down, turn down. More people. Two, four, six, eight. We almost doubled. Uh, OK, hello, everyone. Welcome to my module in 2504. As Yanni said, I've been doing this for about four years now. I hope some of you find it fun. Um, why am I here? Well, about me, so I have a PhD. I'm from Canada. Um, don't hold it against me. I have, a, I have a PhD in computer science from the University of Western Ontario. That's in uh, London, Ontario. Uh, and I did my PhD in computational algebraic geometry. Uh, before that, I was in Vancouver at a university called Simon Fraser University studying pure mathematics. I was also doing computer algebra, so this is very strange. 
um, that I have a computer science PhD, but like before that, my entire pathway was through pure mathematics. So at uh, McMaster University, that's my alma mater for my undergraduate, that's in Hamilton, uh, where I was just doing sort of algebra and, and computer science. Like we didn't really have these dual diplomas at the time, you just took whatever you wanted, right? So somewhat, like one of my uh, objectives here is to prove to some of you pure mathematicians and perhaps convince you um, that you can be deployed into computer science for developing tools for other mathematicians, right? Like, Mathematicians had to invent the calculator for other mathematicians to use. Symbolic com uh, computation is effectively like a higher order calculator, one where we're going to be computing with symbols rather than numbers. And that's like very, very useful for other mathematicians. Now the problem, problem, you need to understand both disciplines in order to work in the discipline. Okay, that's perfect. That is perfect, right? I think the projector detected it on the computer science and then decided to, to not work. That's always the joke. Uh, I have no idea what has happened. If everyone here would just come stand behind me, then we'll sort this. Okay. I don't know. Okay. I hope that doesn't keep happening. Because um, if it does, I may have to switch computers. Okay, we'll see. Uh, where was I? Okay, so you need to be a mathematician in order to understand the math. You need to be a computer engineer in order to implement all of that math properly. Um, and the other thing that I do in my discipline is we're not simply implementing stuff. Like you, um, you've been learning algorithms, like instructions to solve problems uh, given to you at some type of high level language like English. And then we've asked you to implement it. That, that's one version of programming. But there's another, like, who invented the algorithm in the first place? Like, there's, like, the whole category of people who have to be algorithm designers, who sort of, like, don't care about the computer, uh, but care about the problem at hand and actually devising a ordered set of instructions that will solve that problem. Now, let's see. Uh, let me show you the Maple system that I worked in and did most of my sort of all of my dissertation is effectively in this computer algebra system, this commercial computer algebra system. Uh, this company in part paid me, like paid for my scholarship when I was in school. Um, they would kill me if I ever showed Maple like this to actual um, people trying to sell this to. Like marketing would be furious, right? This is the non-fancy, I've reverted this back to the 1980s style version of Maple because it's what I'm, I'm used to. Uh, but you should know like in its natural state, it looks a lot more almost like a living scientific paper. It's, it's a lot more fancy. But I prefer this, right, because I actually have to engineer in here, so I hate the 2D input. Okay, so um, foremost, the, the most important sort of object of computer algebra is that of the polynomial. And that's because we need to exactly represent all numbers. So what are all numbers? Okay, so it can MATLAB, for instance, which is a numerical system, can it represent integers? All of them? Not really, some of them. Can it represent rationals? Some of them, right? That's what the floating point numbers are, like a, um, a sort of a finite collection of some of the rationals. Can it do complex numbers? Kind of, only because it's sort of isomorphic to a vector and it can work with vectors. Um, can it do a number like the square root of two? Or a third? Right? Like, these are pretty big deficiencies in a system that you're trying to give to mathematicians. It's sort of like, I would like to do computations exactly. Oh, do you intend on using fractions? Yes. Oh, sorry. Like, not, not for you. Um, so what we had to do is develop a system where we're able to use most of the numbers that mathematicians are used to using, like a third and the square root of two. So we don't really, at the basis of this system, have numbers living there. The, the most important object is that of the polynomial. Why? So what is the square root of two? How is that described? Pardon me? It's the root of x squared minus two, right? Uh, x squared minus two is what we call the minimum polynomial for the root of two. Um, suppose then, what is the category of those numbers called? those numbers that are roots of polynomials with integer coefficients. 
algebraic numbers, right? So, okay, so we don't really have one in this system. We have the root of x minus one. We don't really have the square root of two. Like, what is, what is even that? It's not a number, it's a property, right? So we, we have x squared minus two. Okay, so we, we have uh, uh, at the bottom of this polynomial, so I'll show you that we can, we can work with them, right? So here's the polynomial. Come on, don't die on me now. Okay, right, and the first thing that you see is we have this sort of structured output. Um, you're gonna have to do this in your project, right? Right now, the polynomials are printing out in a very simplified sort of 1D fashion. We'd like for you to uni utilize Unicode to make them look a little bit prettier. It sounds, it's a little bit harder than you may think because there's a bunch of weird edge cases. Like, we, we don't ever write one times x to the power of one, right? You write x. Um, we don't put a plus symbol in front of that four, but you do put a negation there if there's a, a negative there. Um, we don't write zeros for zero coefficients, right? So anyways, uh, we can have it look nice like this. Here's another random polynomial. Uh, and I can do things like form their quotients, right? And it has structured output like this. I can expand them as much as I want. And here's the magic, right? Here's this magic simplify H. What do you think simplify H is going to do in this instance? I hate this. Um, command for, for, for this reason. Can someone give me a canonical definition for what simplification should mean? Well, it's going to say that. It's factorization. But who's to say that's simpler than the thing that came beforehand? Right? So I don't like this notion of expanding and simplifying. Perhaps here I would prefer to say expand factor. Right? And factor is what I'm going to be teaching you how to do. Does anyone know how to, f like, well, first of all, you know how to factor, right? Um, do you know where that ends, the closed forms? So you can probably factor a quadratic polynomial. Why? Because of the quadratic equation, right? We know how all of those look. Same is true for uh, cubics and quartics. What about quintics? So people are shaking their heads. Some people here are taking Galois theory. Okay, so you know, or I'm telling you, uh, we don't have solutions for quintic equations or beyond. And it's not that we can't find them, it's that they provably do not exist, right? There is no closed form for quintics and above. So the question becomes, how do we factor quartics or quintics and beyond? And I'm gonna show you um, a very amazing algorithm that does this. It's quite simple, but extremely powerful. Um, that's uh, why I chose it as the topic. Uh, but I also want to sort of demonstrate to you that it's factoring is kind of important. What's factoring equivalent to, kind of? Uh, that's not the answer I'm looking for. What can you read off of this that you can't read off of that? It's roots. It's roots are much more discernible from this factorization than from this expansion. Right, so in some sense, factorization is sort of equivalent to solving something. And I shouldn't really have to explain why solving things is important. Uh, but it is, right, for more or less all, all of science. Um, those of you who took Comp 3400 with me know that it's like stupid easy to explain to the computer how to take derivatives of stuff. Because right, there's maybe like four rules that you have to tell it, right? The sum of the derivatives is equal to the derivatives of the sum. You have to tell it product rule. You have to give it, you know, um, a to the x to the n. Its derivative is a n times x to the n minus 1. And once you explain it, you can do stuff like this, right? And get the derivative quite uh, quickly. If we look up here at h, um, we can take integrals of this, but that's not really that impressive. Right, because this is just the polynomial. Any undergraduate student should be able to take the integral of that just by increasing the exponent and multiplying through by the right coefficient. Uh, but what about stuff like f over g? Who, who can integrate this? Where would you start? Huh? Uh, partial fractions and then factorizing and a bunch of stuff, right? But it, it, who cares? Right? I don't want to integrate by hand. In fact, most of us don't integrate by hand. We integrate by using a computer. Uh, some of you have taken a numerical analysis course. Well, one of the things that's very um, an important topic in numerical analysis is that of numerically integrating stuff. And um, why is that a tool at our disposal? Like, why should it, like, if I said go home and numerically integrate something, would you know how to do that? Do you remember what a Riemann sum is? 
Right, that is basically the numerical approximation of an integral. Just choose an arbitrary number of squares. Uh, remember you got a curve, and then under this curve you draw rectangles, and then you, you make the width of those rectangles arbitrarily small, and in its limit that's the definition of, of, of the integral. So any of those summons are going to be some approximation of the integral. But that's not what we do in symbolic computation. Right? I'm saying we have to have the exact solution. So how does that look like in this system? Okay, it looks like this, and everyone may be saying, well, how the hell is that an integral of something, and why is that useful? But it is useful to, ma to mathematicians. So um, here is like the whole part of the partial fraction expansion. So that's sort of like the easy part. This is the hard part, and how do we read this? Well, I'm saying the integral, uh, the integral is equal to this plus the sum of these terms, summons, where this r, is a root of this polynomial, right? It's, it's some fifth, it's an algebraic number with a, oh, it's some fifth root of something, right? Well, what, what, what is it? Well, it's that, that's, that's it. That's the number. It's the root of that. I can't give it to you because it's not a number. It's a number which is only defined by a property, that property. Right, so this is about as far as we can take the integration symbolically. If you want to go further, fine. Then pick a numerical technique like uh, Newton's iteration and, and go get it. So I'm not saying this is the be-all, end-all, because, yeah, there's like, lots of instances in science where this would be insufficient, but symbolics and numerics have to play in concert with one another. Like, you can't numerically solve something until you're given the thing to numerically solve. Right? They need to know, oh, we're searching for roots of here. Um, is root finding even simple once I give you that polynomial? Sometimes, like it depends how ill-conditioned the problem is. Let's hope roots aren't very close to one another. Let's hope roots aren't repeated because then we won't know if we, if, if we found them all. So, so like there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you're working numerically that are evident when you're working um, symbolically, right? So I, I enjoy working symbolically. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you some of the higher order language features before getting into some of the stuff that I personally worked on. Because um, I just want to show you that, you know, this, is, this does all the fancy stuff. Like, look, you can plot all of those things, no problem, and export very nice, uh, what is it called, print quality illustrations if, if you want. Um, we can plot in 3D if, if, if you wish, right? It has all those shaders and all that interesting stuff. Um, we're free to change the coordinate systems that we want to plot in, right? So here's a cool 3D. Uh, sort of shell that's plotted in, what is it, polar co a spherical coordinate system. This is sort of a spiral that goes infinitely into itself. Uh, let's study this equation right here. I think it has a, a name, maybe Ojica? I forget. Some of these systems are so widely used that they get their own names. But it's the sum of cubes, like x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed plus 1 is equal to x plus y plus z plus 1 all cubed. Okay? So that's an expression which I want to plot. And um, what is going to be interesting about this plot? Well, we're going we're to see a surface, but the surface is going to cross over itself somehow. And those crossovers, those intersection points, is the solutions of that system. And like, so this is, my, this is what I'm mostly interested in in um, computer algebra, is solving systems of polynomials. Now I'm going to plot this, but what, what's weird about this plot? It is 3D, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, normally when we plot something, don't we have to plot a function? Is this a function? No, usually when we plot something, one of the variables has to be linear, right? Z is equal to this function of x and y, and we have some domain, and we just say, oh, and thus this part of the domain, this is the elevation given by Z. We don't have any linear term here. Um, so even the fact that we can plot implicitly is really cool. I love this command, right? Because it's just like, yeah, this is, this is it, right? Those, that's that system up there. And we're very interested, uh, or at least I am very interested in studying them, especially the common places where they intersect. Like the real name of the uh, research area I'm from is computational algebraic geometry. Because if you think about like what do we do mostly in math, like it really boils down, or at least system solving, boils down to manipulating shapes in space, right? But how do you explain something like a circle to a computer? A computer is a discrete actor, right? You need to have some codification of all the shapes that you want to do. Well, what is the codification? Algebra, 
right? Algebra can, uh, in a discrete fashion, allow you to define continuous things. So that's pretty cool. And then we have to be in this sort of, sort of, uh, yeah, algebra geometry correspondence, right? There's like a bunch of theorems that allow us to move from from one domain to the other, and it's weird because you lose and gain stuff as you jump from algebra to geometry and geometry to, to algebra. But it, it's it's a really neat interplay. So I, I love this sort of implicit 3D plot because um, you can generate these like really neat neat sort of pictures in space. Uh, not only that, we can animate stuff. So if you've ever seen the Bessel function, there it is. Um, there's just something which I want to do, constrain the scale. So this is the function which sort of uh, simulates what happens if you hit a drum. Okay, you ready? Drum. Drum. <laughs> All right, but we could do stuff like this. And obviously you can make uh, much more interesting things with sliders and all the, right, so search maple, like full features on, on your computer and marketing will have something very nice. Um, I just wanted to mention the graph theory package because when I was a master's student, the individual beside me was building this package and he was very bright. I think one of the feathers in our cap is how well this works. Um, so we all know what a mathematical graph is. It's effectively just, well, give me a bunch of tuples. <laughs> That's a graph, right? Or if you say, if you give me the tuple one, two, I know that there's some agent or node called one, which is connected to another thing called node two. Uh, and then what we normally like to do is draw these in some fashion. So here, here's a graph. Right? This is a undirected, unweighted graph with nine vertices, 15 edges, and two self loops. It's a random graph that I somehow collected. Now, if we wanted to draw this and look at it, one is, what is the most obvious way of doing so? I asked to go home and program something so I could look at this graph. Right, there's a very, there's one obvious thing to do in this setting. Yeah. Um, yeah, draw 15 gone, and then draw the interior of that. So that's obviously not going to be ideal, but, but there you go. Have any of you taken graph theory? Yeah, so do you guys draw graphs like this? No, of course not, like, because we like to draw spatially pleasing graphs. So this fellow had a neat idea. He says, hey, what if we consider all of those edges springs, right? And we, and we just like attach everything with springs, and then we give the graph a good shake. And then we let that graph come to like a stable point. That should stabilize to something prettier looking. OK, so it looks like this, right? Or like, you know, this, or like this, right? Because you can keep shaking it and letting it stabilize to something that you want. And then eventually you should be able to generate a picture of a graph that, I don't know, like you would want to use in a, in a paper or something like that. Okay, so that's something cool that my neighbor did. So now I'll tell you what I did uh, because it's going to be the launching point for talking about, you know, your project uh, uh, effectively. So here is a polynomial. Let's just forget the fact that, like, I expanded it from something. So pretend you don't know the factorization of this. So this is our starting point. Um, again, like, what, what should it mean to solve f in this case? Like, what do you think is going to happen if I hit enter? Like, what, what, do, what would people want right, when I would say solve this? Roots. roots. Okay. But what if the roots aren't numbers? Or what if the roots are algebraic? What do I do then? Right. I think what you're trying to say is factor, like present it in a factored form, and you, and you would be correct, right? So why are you thinking? No, that's not possible. Something. OK, cool. I, I'll blame the machine for it thinking that long. Uh, that was surprising. Um, so you said factor, which was correct. I'll, I'll just do this so we can look at both at the same time, right? Because the reason that Maple was able, able to do this is because it's able to do this, right? So the first point is factoring isn't just some game that we're playing. Factoring is solving polynomial systems, right? Which is of critical importance to science. Are these the roots of these? Let's check. Do we have 1? Do we have square root of 3? Do we have the minus square root of 3? Do we have all of the three third roots of 5? There you go. Right? So Maple just knows that, oh, when you have simple algebraic numbers like this, or at least some of the algebraic numbers, 
have special notation using this radical symbol, but effectively it's, it's, it's the same. It's the same, right? So if I show you how to factor, I've shown you how to solve polynomials beyond quartics, right? Which you should have known is impossible. Can you trisect any angle with a straight edge and ruler? Do you, do you know what that even means? Geez, we're really losing all of the classic math. You, you, know, that comp, you know the thing that in, your, in your compass set that's sharp, right, that draws circles? If I give you that and I give you a straight edge, that is just, <laughs> I swear, that guy's just going back and forth to troll me. If I give you a ruler with no, great, like, with no gradations on it, the question becomes, <laughs> What angles can you draw with a straight edge and a compass? And you can draw a 90 degree angle. You can take an angle you can cut in half. So the question becomes, can you take any angles and cut it into three? And the answer is no. And uh, it's related to the fact that you can't solve quintics, believe it or not. So Galois theory also is a result on what um, angles are, con are constructible with straight edge and, and ruler. All of you should take a Galois theory course. It's quite, do you know about Galois, like the mathematician? Like, do you know what he did that was quite stupid, right? Okay, so like, I have five minutes, okay. Um, well, first of all, he was like sort of a political activist and he died quite young. So there's like a joke that like, sadly, Galois learned that not all problems are solvable by radicals. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's the one joke. But uh, the, the real story is that he fell in love with uh, his best friend's partner, Coquette. And so he did the sensible thing and challenged his friend to a duel to the death, right, over, the, over, the, over this lady. Um, but they were best friends, so they couldn't actually stomach dueling one another. So the duel was like a Hamilton-style duel, like think Ten Duel Commandment type of thing, where they're going to have pistols. So they said, look, load one of the pistols and not the other, and we'll just stand in front of each other and fire to each other's stomachs. We'll let the universe decide. Um, which one of us gets to stay around. So what happens the day before a duel? Because you don't do the duel the same day. It happens like the next day. So you can have a real good sleep about what, you, what you're going to do. Yeah, so he's sequestered, which means you're sort of jailed, so you can't run away like a coward. And in this sequestering, he realized, yeah, I'm going to die tomorrow. Like this was an exceedingly dumb thing for me to do. So he wrote down everything he knew about math on like two pieces of paper in his jail cell. And then mathematicians spent like the next two centuries like, un like unpacking that paper and developing Galois theory effectively. So it's just, what, what could we had more if Galois stuck around? Now the, the, it begs the question, what was the profession of the other fellow who survived? Like who did the universe choose to keep us with? Does anyone know the profession of the guy who survived? Because it's ridiculous. Do you know at Christmas how we like pull apart those like party things? Yeah, he made those. Like that was his profession was like making those Christmas crackers. But who who knows? Like maybe there's some butterfly. Maybe that was some canon moment in our timeline. Well, you don't want to screw with these things. Okay. Anyways, so that's highly related to us factoring, and factoring is the same thing as solving, right? So uh, beyond that, though, what I want to do is solve systems of polynomials, not just one polynomial. What happens if I want to work with a bunch of polynomials? I'm sure you've all taken linear algebra, so you've done some system solving on things that are flat, right? You, you, if I gave you a bunch of hyperplanes, you can tell me where those hyperplanes um, coexist. Now, the natural question becomes, does Gaussian elimination generalize? The answer is yes. Uh, I had this question immediately when I learned it, and it took me maybe 15 years to get the answer. I had to go to graduate school to get the answer to that question, because it's not, it's not simple math. It's high-powered math. OK, so if I give you another G, right? I give you G and I give you F, and now the question becomes, what are the solutions as of F and G as a system? What are their shared roots? How can I get that? Pardon me? So like one thing I can do is just factor G and then like pull out the things that look common. But isn't that the GCD operation? <laughs> right? The greatest common divisor is going to pull out what roots are common to F and G. So if I can do G GCDs and I can do factoring, I can solve systems of polynomials now, right? which is pretty cool. Right? We're going beyond all of this linear. So if I solve this, what is Maple reporting? Oh, it's the root of z squared minus 3. It's the it plus minus the cubed root of 3, which are the common solutions to f and g. 
right? And this is all the univariate setting, and all of your project is going to be done in the univariate setting, but obviously we can take this to multivariates, um, which is the last thing I'll do, and then we'll, we'll move on to actually talking about course material. So here's a system of polynomials in three variables, x, y, and z. This is how they look like, right? This system is called Ojica, right? So you see three surfaces here, and they're like overlapping in space. And the question becomes, what is their overlap? Okay? Think about how MATLAB is, it's, it's hopeless to be deployed on this problem. If I give you a sphere and I cut it with a plane, what do you expect the answer to be? Circle. Can MATLAB say circle? No, it can't. What's the best that MATLAB can do in that setting? Yeah, it can give you a parametric equation. It says, you give me t, I'll give you one of the roots along, along the circle. But it can't properly report back the equation for a circle, which is what Maple would do, because we don't distinguish between numbers and equations. Right? We're saying, your solution is this, this circle. The circle is the, is the solution. Um, if you want points along that circle, that's weird <laughs> to us pure mathematicians, but we can give it to you if you want, using numerical methods. Okay, so how then do I get the solutions off of that? Well, um, the most sort of, the first method for doing so is called grobner bases or Buckberger's algorithm. Now, Buckberger is an Austrian. He's alive, and he recently, semi-recently won an award for being like the most important Austrian because the de de uh, development of this Buckberger's algorithm in the 70s was really, really important, right? It was like the new Gaussian elimination. Right, so I can imagine you invented Gaussian elimination. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Pardon me? Imagine you were a Gauss. Imagine you were a Gauss, yes. Um, hmm. <laughs> Anyways, so I'm going to, there's, I'm, I'm, here is a system of equations that are, have the same roots as Fs. Okay? So you all worked with vector spaces, I'm sure. Okay, so I, I can give you, a set of vectors and a different set of vectors, and I can ask, are these generating the same vector space? And you have various methods of doing this. One of them is to find the standard basis for both and ask if they're the same. What was that algorithm called? Graham, Schmidt, orthogonalization, right? So um, there is an analog to this when working with sets of polynomials. But we don't have vector spaces. We have these things called ideals. Does anyone know what an ideal is? OK, so if I give you a set of vectors, its vector space is formed by um, making linear combinations of those vectors. That is to say, you can sum the vectors and you can scale them by constants. In an ideal, you have a set of polynomials. And I say you can generate new polynomials by summing them. And you can scale them by other polynomials. Right? So if I have sort of the generating set x squared, you're never going to have a linear polynomial because you just can't get it. Right? Everything has to be multiplied by, by x squared. OK, so you don't, you don't, we're not going to be talking about ideals. But what Grobner basis does is this is effectively the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization for polynomial ideals. Okay? Two ideals are equivalent if and only if their um, Grobner basis, when we use the lexical ordering, uh, monomial ordering, um, yeah, are, are, are the same. Now, what the other thing interesting, OK, so what I'm saying is that this Grobner basis has the same roots as that f's. But let's look at the, what is actually in there. OK, so these are the polynomials in there. Do you notice anything about it that is different than the original starting set of polynomials? I'll give you a hint. So the top, the top polynomial has how many variables? That is to say we've eliminated two variables from it. The one underneath are in um, what? Y and Z. And the last one is in X and Y and Z. What does this mean? Oh, pull a root off of this, substitute it into these two, solve those two, get a Y root, sub it into here, get X. So this is sort of like this upper triangular form from Gaussian elimination, right? Really, in Gaussian elimination, that is the strategy. You need to isolate the variables one at, one at a time. Um, so are you satisfied with this being a solution? Can you give me a point in the solution set? OK, so maybe like we need to go further than this. OK, so my laboratory, ORCA, 
the Ontario Research Centre for Computer Algebra, was largely concerned with working in these things called regular chains, which is sort of Gaussian elimination, uh, Buckberger's algorithm plus factoring at the same time, right? Because I'm going to solve the same problem. So I'm saying I want to work in a polynomial ring of x, y, and z. Here's my f's. It's this Ojica system. And we have this triangularized routine, right? Which um, is effectively going to say, uh, try to produce sort of, well, I'll show you. It's better than saying. OK, so I'm going to do this. And this is what it spits out. Is this a nice representation of the solution sets for that? Right, look, you, you can see. Oh, here's one of them. 0, 0, 1, here's another one. 0, 1, 0, here's another one. 1, 0, 0. And the last one is, well, one of the square roots of 2, then y is the negation of that, and x is the negation of that. But it's all of them. Have we found all of them? OK, so here's the original system. This has total degree 2, total degree 2, total degree 2. How, what is the most amount of roots that we can expect to find in this system? You're adding. You should be multiplying. 8. It's 2 times 2 times. Let's think of a different problem. Parabola, that's degree 2. Line, that's degree 1. How many solutions do you expect in that setting? 2, 2 times 1, not 2 plus 1, which would have been 3. Um, right, so what remains here is to confirm that we've actually found all of the solutions. That's where I came in. Okay, so that was my task. Oh, so first of all, let me just hit this button. This is a big feather in our cap. Most people buy maple in order to call this function solve. And what solve does is call the regular chains package. So we're like quite happy about that, right? Because the main drive of the system is solving, and they're using what is, in effect, the technologies coming out of the laboratory that I used to work at. So you can see it's just taking these sets and sort of describing them a little bit sort of differently. They're just explicitly saying, get one of the roots of this polynomial, and then you can carry it up the chain. OK, so for me, what they said was, look, we need to actually confirm that when we found all of these solutions, that we found all of the solutions. So there is a statement. Um, does anyone heard the term intersection multiplicity? So sometimes, um, okay, so we, I want to say something like the weighted sum of roots in this system is equal to the product of the total degrees of the system. What's the weight? Well, the weight is something called the intersection multiplicity. So on the parabola line example, the intersection multiplicity of a line going through a parabola, like the normal intersection, one. Each one counts once. What about the tangent intersections? That will count twice, right? Because it's an intersection that happens at a tangent. And sort of like that's, a, that's basically it, right? You want to count the, it's the dimension of the tangent space at the point of intersection if that intersection is happening. In a, tangentially that needs to be counted. I had six years to figure it out, and I managed to implement this library, Algebraic Geometry Tools, which takes um, our triangularized routine and just adds the secondary part. Triangularize it, but also give me the multiplicity. Let it do a little bit of thinking. Um, so we get something like, you see these numbers? Six years of my life went into producing these numbers. But it's saying these two roots here count once. And actually, these roots here were happening at tangent, so we should count them twice. So two roots here, four, six, eight. Yeah, you found them all. These are all the solutions. Right, so that's really important. I've given you solutions to the system that you can immediately confirm our solution, because you just evaluate your polynomials at that. That's free, effectively. And now you're guaranteed to have found them found them all. So what I have to in impress upon you here is that I didn't, I wasn't given a paper and they said implement this. They said here's a number, we know it exists, we, like there's definitions for it, how do we compute it? Right, so there's a whole field called the constructional mathematics. Um, and what we do in constructional mathematics is actually write constructional proofs, because what is a constructional proof? It's an algorithm for producing an answer to something that you're looking for. And we'll, we'll talk a lot about that today. So I used to work in a laboratory called the CECM, the Center for Experimental and Constructional Mathematics. 
And I'll talk more as soon as I get the screen back. Perfect. OK, um, so that's enough of that. That's enough of that. So now let's start talking about, I'll close this as well. Don't save. Right, so the whole point of that is some of your pre mathematicians who enjoy using the computer, there is a space for you right, to develop tools for other mathematicians to use, which do get used. Um, you'd be surprised how much computers can get used at sort of these higher levels of, like none of us want to actually be integrating in real life or doing any of the linear algebra that you have learned how to do. Um, where no one is doing by hand Schmidt orthogonalizations, right, at, at, you know, in the university uh, ivory, ivory towers, except for you guys, right? We've invented it to punish undergraduate students, that, that in calculus. Okay, so what we're going to start now is talking about computer algebra, because I need to teach you, like, how to build it, and we need to think more critically about uh, things that you've been doing that we've been taking for granted. Like you've been working with polynomials and you've been um, sort of factoring them and dividing them and multiplying them, but we need to speak more precisely about what some of these operations mean and the environments where these things are actually going to be well defined. So I want to give really rigorous definitions to polynomial arithmetic. Um, do the terms uh, integral domain, Euclidean domain, group, ring, do these, are these meaningful at all to some of you? Don't worry too much. So, uh, I'm going to go through some stuff, but you should know that there's also videos that we paid uh, another lecturer to do for this course, where he talks at much greater length about some of the basic algebra and ring theory that I'm going to be going through that may be too, too quick. But uh, honestly, it's not so important that you understand everything perfectly. Like, we're not going to be asking you to do any proofs or anything like that. As long as you sort of get the vibe of what's going on and you understand enough of the terminology to not be totally lost when I'm explaining the factoring algorithm, it should be fine. And me and Yanni are going to be around for a lot of consultations. So, and like, it, truth be told, we actually took the project and made it a lot simpler this year because you have a your shortened time frame this time to, to do it. So, but it should, be, it should be fine. Certainly pretty printing, you should just sort of jump in and, and, and give, it a, give it a go. Okay, um, so first of all, I just want to acknowledge that um, sort of these were notes that I studied from when I was like an undergraduate like you, or sorry, graduate student. Um, so I adapted them for this course. So they're based on Dr. Michael Monaghan's course. Um, so if there's mistakes in this, it's probably my fault, not, not his fault, okay? And uh, Yanni wrote the Julia code. The other thing I have to sort of acknowledge is I don't really use Julia professionally like Yanni or any of the other people teaching you. I, I dabble in it. I'm, I'm going to know enough m maybe to, to help you, but I don't really know it down to its very, very core. So that's not, sorry. I've been trying to learn it. Uh, where, okay, so there's the slides. Uh, there's, they're online if you want to look at them. You just have to run all of these things. So uh, I saw a question on the EdStem about this package instantiate taking a long time. That's normal. Uh, it will only take a long time once. Because what it's doing, it's downloading a bunch of packages, and some of them may be big. Julia has many things. It's not a small footprint. <laughs> right there. OK, so let's just start talking about um, symbolic computation and all the other things that we're going to need. Is this large enough for everyone to read? Yes? OK. So what does it mean? Okay, so we need to compute symbolically, uh, which means we're not going to be able to use floats. Floats are off the table because the, the floats are effectively just rational numbers, but some of them, right? And if we want to work exactly, what I'm saying is like we need the integers, all of them, all of the integers. We need to be able to work with rational numbers with arbitrary number of digits in them. So like floats are off the table, period. We're not even going to talk about them. Uh, because root 2 has to be equal to the square root of 2 and not some approximation of the square root of 2. Right? If we're off by what happens, okay, so basically a number which is a float is effectively an interval. I'm saying the, the solution falls somewhere in here. What happens if you take an interval and you add another interval to it? Interval gets wider. Okay? So when you're working with floats, adding introduces error. When you're doing Gaussian elimination, what are you doing? Adding a lot. 
right? So most of numerical analysis is effectively just trying to avoid adding in Gaussian elimination. Because there's no point in saying, like, what's the person's height? Oh, it's like 1.63 at 4581 meters plus minus a kilometer. It's like, oh, okay, thanks for that. <laughs> like, that's totally useless. Um, so we're not going to have to worry about any of this type of floating point error because we are working exactly. There is no error to propagate through our algorithms. There is a secondary problem of the numbers that we use getting huge, but we have a way of mitigating that through something called Chinese remaindering theorem. Does anyone know about the Chinese remaindering theorem? We'll, we'll get to that. In effect, it means that we can solve this problem using some, not all numbers. And we can solve it a bunch of times, then recombine it to get the solution over all of the numbers. So we sort of got the expression swell problem sorted. So our interest is in performing exact computation over rings with efficient algorithms. In particular, we're going to be working with the integers, right? 0, minus 1, 1, minus 2, 2, and so on. And in particular, I want to work with this ring. And most of the energy of today's lecture is going to be establishing this ring and its qualities and capabilities and what we will and will not be able to do with it. So the ring of polynomials is formed by taking finite sums of terms, and terms are broken into coefficient monomial pairings. So it's, it's you know, something like 3x squared minus x plus 1. That counts as a, as a polynomial. And clearly, we can do things like add them together, multiply them together. Can we divide them? Kind of. Can we get GCDs of them? Maybe. So let's see. OK, so here's the preliminaries. It's first necessary to establish a bunch of terminology. So we're all on the same page when we're talking about this stuff. So let this blackboard end denote the natural numbers. 0, 1, 2. Who are, who's already pissed at me? <laughs> who thinks that the natural should start at 1? Good, because you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong, right? Well, there's a cultural difference at hand here. Some people start naturals at once. Some people start at zero. We start from zero, mostly because that's the way it has to be done <laughs> like that. I wouldn't know why we'd exclude it. Um, Julia is, a, is not a zero index language, though. Yes, or it is. I forget. One index language. OK, that's unfortunate. OK, so blackboard n is the natural numbers. Blackboard z is the, the integers. And we'll use this blackboard p to denote the set of all of the odd primes. Just go ahead and exclude two because the fact that 2 is an even prime, that screws up things usually. And it's also too small to be uh, useful anyways. So we're going to start with the definition of a ring. So what is a ring? Well, more generically, in math, um, you can take any set of anything, and you can imbue that set with operations like a, you know, addition or multiplication. Right? So if you have a set and you're able to imbue it with uh, addition, so that that addition is closed. That is to say, if you add two elements in your set, the sum remains to be in your set. And you have an additive uh, identity. That is, there is some, um, yeah, there is something in your group that acts like 0, right? A, an element b, such that a plus b is a. And you have an inverse, that is, some element b for every a, so that a plus b is equal to 0. Um, then you're called a group. Okay, so the first thing a ring has to be is a group, right? So let's think about a clock. This is the best example uh, of uh, rings and groups. So a clock has 12 hours. Let's just designate 12 as zero for this experiment, right? So what is 11 o'clock plus three? 12, one, two. Okay, um, so is it the case on the clock? If, if I were to add on the clock, do all additions, do all sums end up being a number on the clock? Yes. So we're closed over addition on the clock. Uh, is there a number on the clock that if I were to add it to any hour is 0? Which number is that? 12. What's 3 o'clock plus 12? 3 o'clock, right? So you just go all the way around. That's, that's, that's an identity movement. So 12 on the clock acts as 0. That's why I said maybe we can call it 12, 0 for that reason. Are there additive inverses on the clock? What do I have to add to 6 to get 0? 6, right? Not minus 6, because minus 6 isn't in the, in the set. To 7, we would add 5. OK, so it seems that a clock is a group if we have defined addition the way that we've defined. OK, cool. Right? So all of this is basically to demonstrate that this set of polynomials is going to be a ring. 
So let's think. If I have a set of polynomials, can we add them? Is the addition a polynomial? Is there something that's acting like a zero? Yeah, zero. Is there something that acts as the inverse of a polynomial? Yeah, minus that polynomial. OK, cool. So it seems that at least the ring of polynomials, bare minimum, is a group, because it has closed addition, identity, and, and a zero. Uh, what else do we have to be to be a ring? Well, you need to be a monoid. That is to say, you have some type of multiplication operator, and that multiplication operator is associative. What is the importance of associativity here? Or really, why do we insist on associativity? Well, one of the reasons is if we didn't use it, we would have to have a billion brackets everywhere, right? Associativity effectively is the rule that says how you bracket this doesn't matter. It's all equivalent. So why don't you just dispense with writing brackets uh, because of this, this rule, right? So that's, you know, OK. So you, we do, it won't matter. A times B times C will be the same thing as A times B times C, right? So, so we won't get all this bracket pollution. And also, to be a monoid, you have to have a multiplicative identity, something that behaves as a unit, as, as a one. OK, so let's think back to our clock. Is a clock with 12 hours a monoid? OK. Is the, is the pr product associative? Yeah, it seems to be. Do we have multiplicative identity for every element? No. Do we have multiplicative identity for some of them? Which ones? OK, so 5, for example. So what do I multiply 5 by on a clock to get back to 1? 5, 10, 15, that's 3, 5. Yeah, 5 times 5 is 25, mod 12 is, is 1. OK, so on the clock, some of the hours have a multiplicative inverse, but other ones don't. And there is nothing that you can multiply 2 by on the clock to get back 1. Yeah? Can you not see this before I say that I'm multiplicative? Oh, no. I've jumped ahead to something else. Yeah, thank you. OK, to be a monoid, yeah, you just have to mul have multiplicative identity. You have to have something that behaves as a 1. And on the clock, of course, 1 is that unit. Sorry, thank you for that correction. Um, the last thing that we have to be to be a yeah, what I was talking about was fields. I don't know why I'm, I'm jumping ahead so much. Sorry, is that motorcycle is still just driving around in my, in, in my head. As I said, this is not too important, right? Okay, so the, the last thing we need to be to be a ring is we have to have distribution of addition, uh, distribution of multiplication over addition. So it has to be the case that A times B plus C distributes like this, and B times C times A distributes like this, right? So if you have a set which uh, obeys the group ad additive rules, which has multiplication, which has a unit, which distributes over addition, then we're a ring. And what I want to say is that the polynomial ring is that. Right? It satisfies all of these properties. So we can at least add and multiply using polynomials without sort of reproducing something outside of that set. So is the trivial set containing 0 a ring? Yes, right? Because there is addition over it, very basic addition. There's an inverse. There's an identity. They just happen to be the same thing in some cases. How about the naturals? Do they form a ring? No, because there's no identity. Oh, um, yeah, that's wrong. Like, no additive inverse right here. There's obviously an identity. I, went on, I just went on a lecture about how it has to include 0. right? But um, this is weird, because like you can subtract some things on n, but not all things on, on n. Like 4 minus 2 is 2, but 2 minus 4 is minus 2. It's like, so one of the directions is actually OK. Same thing will happen with division. 4 divided by 2 is OK. 2 divided by 4 is not. Right? So we've got to be more careful about things. And arithmetic on the clock forms a ring, as we just discussed. OK, zero divisors. So this is going to be the bane of our existence when working computationally. A zero divisor is something that it's two non-zero terms that make that whose product becomes zero, which is bizarre that zeros can sort of appear without inviting zero to the party. Are there zero divisors on the clock? Give me a zero divisor. Three. Why? Three times four is zero. Well, that's bizarre. Three is not zero. Four is not zero. But their product is zero. Right? Bad stuff happens when you have in, um, these um, zero divisors in your system. So the, the first thing we want to be able to do is sort of like prohibit them. 
right? So we want to ensure that our ring doesn't have these, and then it will become an integral domain, right? So an integral domain is a non-zero, so like just forget about the trivial ring. An integral domain is a non-zero commutative ring without zero divisors. All right, so again, groups, that sets with addition. If you also get multiplication, then you become a ring. If that multiplication doesn't introduce zero divisors, then you're an integral domain. And we're gonna keep building from, from here, okay. The integers form an integral domain. That should be fairly clear. Um, otherwise, give me two non-zero integers whose product is zero. It's not gonna, it's not gonna happen, right? Um, I don't know how we'd prove that. Probably something about their products having to be sort of, the magnitudes have to all be the same, something like that. I wouldn't know. Okay, so what about clock arithmetic? Okay, n this is, does not form a uh, integral domain because three times four is 12 and 12 is zero in our interpretation of arithmetic on the clock. Um, how can we fix it on the clock? Yeah, what happens if we made the clock 13 hours or five hours? Think about what the problem is here. T 12 factors into three times four and it's zero. So anything that can uh, reproduce that will also be zero. So what we want is a number of hours that doesn't have any prime decomposition, right? Because then there will be no opportunity to make that zero asides with the zero itself, right? So if we had a clock with seven hours on it, no zero divisors are possible. Okay, and the question is, will our polynomials form this integral domain without zero divisors? It's a little bit complicated, but it shouldn't be too hard to sort of argue that, hey, if you give me two non-zero polynomials, there's no way I'm gonna be able to multiply them together so that they become, they become zero. Okay, field, so we've done addition, and I guess subtraction comes for free along with that because it's just sort of inverse addition. We have multiplication, but what about in, the inverse of multiplication, division? Do we get to divide polynomials? Not necessarily. Can we even divide integers? Kind of, right? We have this long division that we've been using. Okay, so the next thing that we want to sort of talk about is, is something called a field. And a field is a ring that has division in it, which effectively means a field is a ring where every element is invertible, okay? So let's think about what it means to be invertible. I know what's happening. I had to buy a new laptop to stop this problem from working, but I don't want to buy a new Maple license. So my Maple is on this computer. Uh, I have no way of transferring it. Okay, sorry about that. Next time, I'll bring my other computer next time because I won't need Maple again. All right. Okay, so th the rationals clearly form a field, trivially, right? If I say here's a fraction, A over B, what do you have to multiply that by to get one? Mm. Yeah, just, just take the reciprocal of that fraction and then those things will multiply to one, like provided that your, uh, the numerator wasn't zero. You, you, we're never gonna be able to in invert zero in any of these, these rings. Okay. So what happens over like the integers? Okay, we can't divide them, right? We can, we can divide four by two, but we can't divide two by four. So wasn't it weird? Didn't you learn division before you learned fractions? How's that possible, right? You're, you're defining an operation which is supposed to be like an, an inverse operation which would merit you moving to fraction. So what did they teach you instead? How would you do two divided by four? if you were in grade three, what would the result of that be? You don't know what a fraction is, but nonetheless, you still learned what that division was. Zero, two, remainder. Zero remainder two, right? Or you learned that seven divided by four was one remainder three, right? So before learning about fractions, you learned about sort of a type of division where you'd produce a quotient and remainder instead. Okay, so we're gonna learn how to do that with our polynomials. And you should have done synthetic division back in high school. Yeah, I'll teach you some tricks. There's some things that we never told you that would have trivialized all of that. Um, so do you know when you take f divided by g, that 
algebraic operation is equivalent to evaluating f at all of the roots of g. So if I asked you to do something like x cubed minus 2x plus 1 divided by x minus 2, all you had to do was evaluate the numerator at 2. That, uh, fact check me on this, right? This, but this is actually what the geometric interpretation of that algebraic operation is doing. It is, and this is important actually, because none of you said, look, um, I agree that you can uh, encode algebraic numbers as polynomials. But then how do I use them for arithmetic? So my response to that would have been, oh, division. Division is equivalent to evaluation in this setting. Right? Because if you took sort of like x to the fourth and you divided it by x squared minus 2, you're going to get 4, right? which is evaluating x to the fourth at the square root of 2. Right? So we do have an evaluation procedure that comes by way of doing remaindering. And so remaindering is a huge... Uh, important thing that we're going to learn how to do, right? because that, that's, that's evaluation in this. It's very interesting once you learn about all the geometric, uh, like what's happening geometrically while doing all of these algebraic operations. Did, did they talk to you much about this when you were doing Gaussian elimination? Because like what you're really doing in that setting is moving around the hyperplanes in such a way that none of the roots of the hyperplanes are moving but the resulting movement is going to actually like, isolate those points for you somehow. But you're still manipulating shapes in space by way of doing algebra, which is the thing that enables us to use a computer to, to sort of talk about topology and stuff like that. So it's very cool. OK, so here's the division algorithm, um, which is the one that you learn from high or elementary school. Right? If I give you two integers, and that let's just say b is positive, just so we don't have to talk about uniqueness or anything. I can say there is unique q in r called the quotient and remainder. Satisfying r is less than the absolute value of q. And we have a is equal to bq, bq plus r. Right? So th this a is the numerator, b is the denominator, q is the quotient, and r is the remainder. Um, so let's just do some Julia now. Right? So I have a is 23. I have b is 7. And in Julia, this division operator naturally is giving you remainder. Right? So it's not really giving you division. And be careful, because if you do this, which is integer division from Python, which some of you may be used to, what is this in Julia? Fractions. fractions. Right? So fractions are in the system already. So be careful. This would have been something very hard to pin down, because numerically everything would have been fine if you were doing stuff with fractions. So it's, it's that division symbol. Um, so what is the remainder upon dividing 23 by 7? Or the quotient, actually, in this case? 3. What's the remainder? 2, right? Because 7 goes into 23 three times, up to 21. And then there's 2 left over. Uh, here's an invariant. I just say, basically, a is equivalent to b times q plus r. We get true. So here's how you could implement such a thing in Julia. We can talk about some of these features. Uh, what does this mean here? That we're saying A is this abstract type T. Why do we want to do that? Well, because I don't want to have to write a remain. What's, what's remainder going to work over, actually? But not only integers. Well, at least integers, but in this setting, that means int 128, int 64, int 4, right? Like all of the various ways that the computer itself can represent integers. Uh, is this algorithm or piece of code going to differ for any of those types? Not really, or no, no it shouldn't. Right? So this is smart. We want to write one function that's going to be utilized by Julia to do uh, remaindering on any integers, rather than having to write one each. And actually, it's the case that it's, this could work more broadly on, on um, a Euclidean domain. Right? This really should be any type that acts as a Euclidean domain. That is to say, any type which has the remainder algorithm in it should be able to use this function. But for us, we'll just stick with integers. But no, we will be doing this for polynomials as well. We'll get a remainder algorithm for, for polynomials. Um, so here's the algorithm. It's, it's very simple. If a is less than 0, we'll just change it to be it's, it's positive. This is the sort of cute way of doing an if statement. 
right? So if this fails, it will just go to the next term, and if it passes, then this will occur. Uh, otherwise, uh, just return a. Wait, hold on. Oh, sorry, these are two if statements. If a is less than zero, then sort of negate it, make it positive. If a is less than b, then return a, right? If, um, like, what's three? Yeah, 3 mod 6 is 3, right? There's nothing to do there. Uh, and then otherwise, here's, here's the main routine, where you just remove one of the denominator from the numerator, and you just repeat that, right, until you can't do it anymore. Now, these are all recursive routines. All my 30, anyone else took 3,400 with me here? No, okay, so when you write a recursive, does, can I, does, does everyone familiar with the term recursion? So recursion is just when a function calls itself. And actually, using recursion makes a lot of things way more elegant. Okay? And the important thing about recursion is that the input coming in is smaller than the input on the outside. Uh, is it the case that we're, this function calls something smaller than we originally gave it? It gets a and b, and we're calling it with a minus b, b. Okay, so certainly that's going to be, going to be smaller. And eventually, it should descend and hit one of those two. Right? But this is just a simple remainder algorithm as uh, implemented in Julia. So there you go. Let's just check that it's working. Now, we do have, don't use this remainder algorithm because someone much more smart than us implemented something way faster than it, right? We don't really want these very core functions to be implemented naively, right? Because they're going to be called billions of times. So you better bet there was a lot of energy going into like integer multiplication, for example. You talked a little bit about Karatsuba and of course, changes a little bit every year. Um, okay, so do use this rem or this modulo operator. Some of you should be familiar with the percent sign being the modulo operator. Um, we can just do some more checks here to show that they're all the same. The quotient is uh, effectively identical, except you're getting the quotient instead of the, the, the remainder. So there it is implemented. Uh, of course, we have, uh, so how many times does 5 go into 15? Three times, so 3 is its quotient. How many times does 101 go into 4? Zero many times, so that's why I get 0 here. How many times does 4 go into 125? Well, 31 times uh, plus one, one remainder. So we can just sort of walk through uh, a bunch of examples and just print in a structured way. Those of you from Python know of the string formatter. So this is a string formatter. If you put a dollar sign in front of a variable, it's going to dump in the value for that variable and not print out dollar sign A literally. So we can just do a little thing here, right, where it says 15 is equal to uh, its uh, quotient times numerator uh, plus, uh, sorry, the numerator is equal to the quotient times the denominator plus the remainder in each case. Right, so 15 is 3 times 5 plus 0. 4 is 0 times 101 plus 4. 125 is 31 times 4 plus 1, right? So of course in Julia we have the primitive modulo operator and division uh, operator for respectively remainder and quotient, but be careful to not use double slash because that is the, uh, what we use for fractions in the system. All right, so let me just check this out here. All right, that's a fraction. This is the fraction 23 sevenths. Uh, which corresponds to this float, which of course is not enough precision, right? This is not genuinely the same number as 23 over 7. Or maybe it is. If this was a 3 or a 9, then it wouldn't be. I'm not actually sure that's insufficient. It may be exact. But the point is it won't always be. So here's how I like to remember this remainder algorithm. It's kind of like working with improper fractions. Is that a term in Australia? Yeah? Okay, so you have something like 23 sevenths. Like we call this an improper fraction. And to make it a proper fraction, we can break it into 3 plus 2 sevenths. Right, so if you take this expression here and multiply through by 7, you get the expression on the right, uh, which is the statement to both the quotient and, and remainders. I, somehow I just remember it better like, like this. Um, the reason you've seen this before is exactly for this reason. Right, you needed to learn how to do polynomial remaindering to do synthetic division in order to do some integrals. Right, you had f over g, and the first step was if the degree of f is bigger than the degree of g, you need to do a remainder operator right, to basically take that improper polynomial fraction and make it a proper one. Right, so we can just see that we have some identities here too. Oops. Um, so what's, how many times does 7 go into 23? Three times, and there's the fraction. Right, so just be careful about that. 
And that's the, uh, the identity that I wrote up there. OK, cool. OK, so we have groups, which are sets of elements with addition and zeros and ones. We have uh, rings, which get you multiplication, which also have to have a zero and a unit, and distribution. Uh, and then on top of that, if we have no zero divisors, then we have something called an integral domain. Right? So just keep that in mind. Right? We're, just, we're, we're, we're adding restrictions to our set to assure that certain operations exist that we're eventually going to implement into the, into the computer. All right, so let's talk more about these clocks. So I call these things residue classes. Somehow people here don't like that. Um, the other term, so when I say residue class, do you know what a congruence class is? OK, so you can just think congruence class. But what I really mean to say is that I'm collecting, this is really frustrating, but we'll just wait a second. OK. Um, so we're going to be, I can't, we need to work with all of the integers, but we can't. So we're going to use the Chinese remainder theorem to fix that. We're going to talk about that soon. So we're going to now have to sort of discuss what working with some of the integers is going to look like. OK, so let's work with n many integers, 0 through n minus 1. And we're going to call this a, a residue class, because if what we're working, what this really is, is all of the numbers necessary to work modulo n. Okay, if I was working on a clock, you need the numbers 0 through 11 only, right? Because something like 17 o'clock is really um, 5. Okay? So you'd have a class of numbers 5, 17, 39, the next one, <laughs> which I can't calculate. Uh, and that's a class of numbers. And 5 is the standard representative of that set of numbers. And if you take all of the standard representatives for the clock at 0 through, uh, 0 through 11, that's called a residue class, right? all of the standard generators. So, but that doesn't really matter. It's just sort of uh, notation and nomenclature. OK, so we want to work mod n. So I can say things like, if I'm on a clock, I have uh, 11 o'clock plus 3 is 2 mod 12. Right, so where this, this triple equal is equivalence, and this mod is effectively the percent sign operator. Right? This, is, this, is fine. this is the remainder of 14 when you divide out 12. That's why we're talking about remainders. Remainders and modulus are effectively the, the same thing. Um, what's it, why do we need triple equal here and not equal? Like, why do we have a, why, what's the difference between equivalence and equality? This is always a little bit funny to talk about, but it is necessary. Well, I'll just ask you this. Is 17 o'clock the same as 5 o'clock? Not really, because it's 17 and not 5. But is it the same time? Yeah, so they're equivalent, but they're not equal, <laughs> right? So that's why we use this, this triple equal sign, right? So it's sort of a weaker equality. Um, I don't know, I always found that a little bit interesting. Okay, so here's, here's, the, meth here's the notation. I'm going to say A is congruent to B mod C. Uh, and this is effectively asserting that the remainder of A on division by C is B. Right, this is just the more number theory way of, of working with it. Right? So we're going to talk about moduluses, we're going to talk about remainders, but effectively it's, it's, they're synonymous. Okay? We have already seen something similar with overflow. You have already been working with modular arithmetic, unbeknownst to you. So think about it like this. I have to, I have to hide it down here. Can you see? That's an 8-bit integer. Okay, so you've learned a little bit about what this means. OK, so um, what's the largest 8-bit integer? 255, right? Because you have all the, you have eight places to put bits. So that's 2 times 2 times 2, 8 times. That's 256 different configurations of those 8 bits. The 0 one is 0. The last one is 256. OK, so I'm saying you have 2 to the power of 8 minus 3, which is 252. And I'm going to add 4 to that. What's the result? What, what, what is Julia going to say that the result of this is? First of all, what is 252 plus 4? 256. What did you tell me the largest 8-bit number was? 255. What is Julia going to report back? 
Well, what should it be? Right? One. Unless I said something wrong out loud. This is 2 to the power of 8 minus 3 plus 4. Uh, right? Would the right be extra 1 with, or would it be 0 only if you had Yeah, if I made this 3, it would be. So I went to the, I went to the last number. Um, that's an 8 bit number. And I went back 3 from there. And then I went forward 4. Right, so. I think both interpretations are kind of equivalent. Like we're just talking about rotating, like, you know, one of us are moving the clock clockwise by 12 hours and the other one's going anti-clockwise by, by 12 hours. So you wouldn't expect this to be one, right? That number. Or would you, right? I'm saying this is 252 plus four and it says one. I would, none of you would find that surprising. Oh, to, am I saying it wrong? Shiza, what is this? Hold on. 257. Oh, no, sorry. So 256. Oh, sorry, 253. Okay, no wonder all of you are looking at me so confused. <laughs> I like to say I was only off by one. So like, what's the problem? Okay. Anyway, the whole point here is, is that when you're, when you're working with an 8-bit number, you're not really working with addition properly. You're working over the residue class of 256 numbers. You have 0 through 255. So that is to say if you take 253 and add 4 to it to get 257, you're not going to get 257 back. You're going to get 1 back because you're working on a clock with 256 hours. So this isn't wrong. This is the correct response for working in that group, right? And the same is going to be true for 128-bit numbers, 256-bit numbers. This is not wrong. You just have to have the, it's, just, it's giving you the answer to uh, the arithmetic in a different setting. But it, it's not wrong, like so, so to speak. OK, so there's um, this thing called the mod. There's also something called the symmetric mod. Um, we're going to be using both, but it doesn't really matter. It's just swapping out the canonical represent, like the canonical numbers in the class. So on a clock, we could have um, 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 11, or we could designate 11 as minus 1, right? And 10 is minus 2, 9 is minus 3, all the way to 6, or maybe 7. I don't know, that you have to cut it in half and somehow if it doesn't cut in half properly. But the point is, instead of going from um, here, from, instead of going from 0 to 7, we can go from minus 3 to 0, 0 to 3. So we can get some negative numbers back. And often the case that this is attractive uh, when writing out polynomials. Um, because it's, it's easier to see, if I were to ask you to add like x plus minus x, Right? That's much better than asking you to perform that same computation with all positive numbers where you have to know that you're, like, you're overflowing to some type of, of zero. Right? So we're going to be working with both mod and symmetric mod. Um, so the trick is this. It's very easy to convert between the two. Why is 5 congruent to minus 2 s mod 7? Because 7 minus 2 is 5. Right? That's, that's how you convert back, back and forth. It's also very handy to, to know this because what is minus 1 mod 7? So what is 6 squared mod 7? 1, because it's minus 1 squared. And doing minus 1 squared is easier than doing 36 mod 7. Right, so that's why it's sometimes more useful to be working in the, in the symmetric mod. So I think that's part of your project, actually, is to implement the symmetric mod. But it's quite easy. I've, I've given it to you here. Right, you just have to shift all numbers by n half, or the quotient of n half. Right, you're never to use division. If anywhere in your code you, you generate a float, stop. You, you violated symbolic computation by introducing floats. Everything here has to be done with integers. Like the whole thing depends on integers having exact uh, additions and multiplications and, and, and stuff of that nature. OK, so let's just investigate now some of these different groups and rings. OK, so um, Z6, the number 0 through 5, is it a group? Well, let's start looking. So we have n equals 6. Um, I'm going to generate, what is this called? 
What's that? Okay. Sequence. Sequence. All right. All right. So it's just a, a way, or I guess in this case it's called unit range, but this is going to contain all the numbers 0 through 5 inclusive. So I can do a type of list comprehension here. What I'm going to start doing is generating multiplication tables, but like for addition. So this is going to be an addition table, and then we're going to study the properties of the addition table and try to discern some properties of, of, of the group. So I'm just going to say, um, give me x plus y mod n um, for y from 0 to 5 and for x from 0 to 5. And it's going to give us a matrix, and the matrix is going to look like that. So here's how you read this addition table. Let's go away. OK, so this is 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus, uh, 0 plus 0 is 0. 1 plus 0 is 1. 0 plus 1 is 1. So like an arbitrary position here, this would be 0, 1, 2, 3. And this is 3 plus 0, 1, 2. So zero, uh, 3 plus 2 is 5 in this addition table. What does it mean that we can find zeros all the way through here? That is true, but like, what's the general thing that is true like, so about this? Hmm. We found a zero in every column. What, what is the importance of that? Yeah. Every element has an additive inverse. OK, so this means it's a group, right? Because everything remained in this table. Every element has an additive inverse. Uh, what does it mean that this table is symmetric? That is, the matrix is equivalent to its transpose. Yes. the, the um, addition operator is abelian or commutative, right? I forgot that the fancier term for commutivity existed, so I'll, I'll, I'll use abelian now just to sound more, more fancy. Okay, so the addition table is symmetric. That means uh, we have an abelian operator, a commutative operator. Uh, there is an identity element because that row is fixed and that column is fixed, so that is the, the place where we find the zero. And each column and row has a zero, and, th and thereby each element has an additive inverse. So we can conclude this is a group. Okay, so we're just going to do some extra fun stuff. Who knows what this is going to do? So the dot is doing some type of uh, sort of piecewise operation. Yeah. Yes. Yes, but what's the effect? What is going to come out of this computation? Effectively. Tell me where all the zeros are in this matrix, right? And the fact that we can find a single one in each of these columns means that we can conclu conclude that we have additive inverses. We could do something a little bit more fun. Um, this fine first, uh, we're going to, um, well, let me just put it out. So what this is going to do, it's saying, what is the additive inverse of zero? Zero. Because it found the first zero in this column, and it was at the zero point. What is the additive inverse of one? Well, it's five. Because the first column, we found a non-zero in the fifth place. What is the additive inverse of two? Well, it's four. Because in this column, which corresponds to addition on two, there is a one in its fourth row, right? So that's what the um, sort of this operation is doing, which is, which is kind of fun. We're just showing off some of the Julia, Julia features. OK, let's move now from addition to multiplication. So here's the multiplication table for the same setting. We're working with 0 through 5 mod 6. So the first row is multiplying everything by 0. The first column is multiplying everything by 0. Things seem to be sorted there. Is this a field? What would have to be true about this if it was a field? Yes. Oh, so you're saying the fact that zeros are present in the interior of this is indicative that it can't be a field. Yeah, it's true. It's, well, yeah, I think that's true. Well, at least these zeros mean that we have zero divisors in the, in the group, which is bad. But what, what's, the, what's the thing that a field definitely needs to have? Every element needs to be invertible. And if every element was invertible, what should we be able to find in every column? A 1. Is there a 1 in every column? Which columns are there ones? And does it make sense? The first row corresponds with which element? 
one. Is that invertible? Always. What other element should be invertible? Minus one. What's minus one in this set? Five. Is there a one in the fifth column? Oh, is it number theory fun? <laughs> like, okay, so we're learning. All right, so like we can, if we take finite amounts of integers, like we, we can form types of groups and rings that have properties, but this one is not that great because if we choose six integers, we don't actually generate a field, and I want a field. Okay, so let's see. Not all the rows contain a one, which means there are some elements that, that do not have multiplicative inverses. For example, there is nothing that you can multiply two by mod six to get one. We, zero, one, two, look, nothing. We're just going zero, two, four, zero, two, four. Okay. Um, so again, we can do something. So there's all of the images of two. And if I do this, um, it's saying that Elements with multiplicative inverse are one and five, and those without multiplicative inverses are the rest. Okay, so we talked about this. Z6 is not a field because, um, well, for one, if it was, every element would be obligated to have an inverse, and two is not invertible. But how about instead of choosing six, we choose P, where P is a prime? Okay, what happens then? So here's Z5, which is going to give us the numbers zero through four. And let's run the same experiments again, right? So n equals 5, zen into 0 through 4. Here's our multiplication table. The first row is all zeros, okay? That corresponds to multiplying by 0 on the left, let's say. The first column is all zeros. That corresponds to multiplying by zeros on, on the right. Is it the case that every column has a 1 in it? Does this mean that every element is invertible in this set? Does this correspondingly mean that z5 forms a field? Perfect. Okay, so now we, we can work with some of the integers in such a way where we're guaranteed to have multiplication and division at our disposal, which is great, okay, because that's going to be important. And the only thing that we have to do is work with prime many numbers. We won't discuss why sort of that works, but we'll never work in a number field of like characteristic eight. So you may hear me say we're going to be working in residue classes of prime characteristic, which means to say there's going to be prime many of them. The characteristic of a ring is how many times you have to multiply an element against itself to get back zero. Right? So if you're working with p, if you multiply anything by p, which effectively is the zero in that set, and you're going to generate that zero. So again, here's just some information. Elements with multiplicative inverse, all of them. Elements without a multiplicative inverse, zero. So you're not obligated to give an inverse for zero. Zero is always the, the, the special one that we leave aside. So just notice every column here has a one. That means every column here is invertible. Um, the third column indicates that the inverse of 3 is 2, and correspondingly, 3 two times 2 is, is 1 mod 5. Now, I want you in the back of your head to, to remember, I'm, going, I'm doing two developments here. We're talking about the integers and properties the integers have, but my true intent is to carry this functionality over to polynomials, because my claim is that polynomials is a number system of some type if you have the perspective that they're encoding algebraic numbers. So do you think we're going to be able to make like the polynomial ring a field in an integral domain and stuff and stuff like that? And I don't know. We'll, we'll keep searching. Okay. So GCDs. Who is who has dealt with the greatest common divisor algorithm? How do you what? Well, okay. So okay. Two questions then. Who knows what a GCD is? What is the GCD of three and twelve? Three. Okay. How do we compute that? Yeah, yes, yeah. right, like with a computer. OK, thank you. Um, formally, what is the method called for computing the GCD? Euclid's algorithm. OK, and what types of um, sets give us Euclid's algorithm? Euclidean domains, right, are effectively rings which also have the GCD algorithm, right? And we'll have other um, types of rings which are important, like una unique factorization domains is going to be pretty important um, for our factorization adventure because there better be a unique way of factoring stuff before we attempt those factorizations. Okay, so we do, um, you do know of the greatest common divisor. You should know Euclid's algorithm because it's one of the most centrally important algorithms like ever devised. 
So let's, let's talk about it a little bit more acutely. So the greatest common divisor is like one of the most fundamental operators of the computer algebra system. Um, I actually found a bug in the GCD algorithm in the Maple system, a pretty serious one, which is a feather in my cap because it's like one of the atomic operators, like the whole, the whole system it, itself. I still remember. It was the GCD of t and t squared plus t mod 2 was, was reporting as 1. I spent three weeks looking for that, assuming my code was the problem, and it was their code was the problem. And my supervisor had no sympathy for me. He said, Paul, you have to, you have to expect this sometimes. Right, so you are able to blame the product occasionally. You just have to ascend high enough in the ranks of academics, I suppose. Okay, so let's give a statement of it. I give you two integers. Both of them can't be zero. One of them can be zero, actually. I'm just going to define what the GCD is, right? The GCD of A and B, the noted GCD A of B, is the GCD when the following three things hold. Um, you are familiar with this d divisible by? Right, so G divides A and G divides B, right? Means G is a common divisor. We want to find the greatest one. So I'm saying, okay, so first of all, G is a common divisor. If we find another divisor, H, then H has to divide G. This is just a way of codifying that G is in fact the largest divisor because any other common divisor has to divide it. And three, we're, for uniqueness sake, we're just going to um, specify that GCDs have to be positive because technically since we're dividing, negative G would also suffice here. So let's just say, look, it's positive, so we're generating unique ones. So for example, the GCD of six and four is two. Uh, because 6 is 2 times 3, and 4 is 2 times 2, right? And the largest factor between that's shared between them is 2. What about 6 and 0? Well, the reason that we designate 6 and 0 to have a GCD 6 is for this reason. 6 is really 1 times 6, and 0 is like, can be factored any way that you damn well want. So in this setting, I can say, yeah, like six is, uh, 0 is 0 times 6. I found 6 in both. So that's how we're going to designate it as that. What's the problem if I were to put two zeros in here? Is the GCD one? Is the GCD two? Is the GCD, yes, all of those things, right? So you can't, since it's all of them, it, it doesn't have definition, right? Functions have to give you back one value. It can't give you a, a bunch of values. And that's the same reason we can't divide one by zero, because zero goes into one once, and twice, and three times, and four times, and five times, which is also why it trends to infinity. That's pretty neat. Uh, okay, so let's keep going. So how then do I actually prove that such a thing exists? Right? So this is sort of like what I found myself in in my PhD studies. They said, look, there's a value. It's called the GCD, except in my case it was intersection multiplicity, but imagine we're in Gauss's era. Right? I want this value. It's defined like this. Get it for me. How? How would you do it? Huh? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So like, well, what I'm looking for is, well, we just have to tell everyone how it's constructed. And how do, you exp how do you give a construction for something? With an algorithm, right? Some high level set of instructions that will terminate necessarily on the answer you're looking for. Um, so here it is. Uh, as let me mention that in Julia, we do have a GCD algorithm. And it is one of those primitive functions for which tons of energy have gone into uh, writing. Okay, so I'm just going to multiply five random numbers together between 1 and 100 and then find their GCD. Okay, pretty fast. I'll try it again. Pretty, f right? That should have been different. Jeez, I was just getting unlucky. Yeah. Oh, that's, oh, yes, you're right. 100. Okay. Okay, 45. 10, cool. Okay, so it's happening pretty fast. So these, these numbers aren't necessarily small. Let's see if we can do, I don't know, this may be a big mistake. Let's double it, <laughs> just see if it's still fast. Yeah, still fast. Okay, so like not only can, is there an algorithm, but the algorithm is fast. Because like one way we could have done it is just gone through all of the numbers and done test divisions, but that would have been too slow to be useful for anything. So what um, Euclid did is provide um, a, a construction but by way of just enumerating a bunch of properties of the GCD itself. And then an instruction set falls out of that, which is kind of cool. So here is a lemma, I think given by Euclid. Um, the GCD has the following properties. 
The GCD of A and B is the same thing as the GCD of B and A. Furthermore, if you take A and you do sort of this grade school style division to get a quotient and remainder, so suppose that A is equal to B, the quotient, or B, the uh, denominator, times Q, the quotient, plus R, then the GCD of A and B is equal to the GCD of R and B. So we've replaced A with R, and this is important. Why? Okay, well, when we'll look at the algorithm, we'll discuss it again. It's smaller. And when we're defining recursive algorithms, what we really need to happen is ensure that the recursive call is calling something smaller, because eventually we want to hit the smallest thing called the base case, so the function will return. And then finally, the GCD of A, B is the same thing as the GCD of A minus B, B. OK, so I'm saying from these three properties, I can make an algorithm, which is fast, which produces GCDs. Here it is. Right? So if b is 0, return a. Right? That's by the definition. The GCD of anything with 0 is anything. OK, so now at this point, we can assume the two inputs are not 0. And I'm just going to com combine rule 1 and 2. You give me a and b. I'm going to find r. That's this. And I'm just going to sort of swap the, swap the input. Okay? And the input coming in is necessarily going to, is this necessarily smaller than b? What's the largest remainder you can have mod b? b minus 1. So that position necessarily is smaller. Has to be. Has to be. What's the, what's the stopping condition? b0. So I'm saying at every step of this algorithm, b, the input to b is descending um, monotonically, which means it has to hit 0 which means this is an algorithm which computes the GCD, which is properly an algorithm because it terminates, which is a necessary uh, quality for an algorithm to be an algorithm. Don't forget that part of it. Right? An algorithm is an ordered, unambiguous set of instructions that terminates. Right? So there it is. So the, the GCD algorithm, the Euclid's algorithm, is very elegant and small and works very quickly. And this will work on not just numbers, but anything that's a Euclidean domain, which the ring of polynomials is. So we're going to be able to get GCDs of polynomials. Who cares? Well, what did I say GCDs of polynomials are doing? System solving. OK? So already this brief two lines of code are helping us do system solving. All right? So this plus factoring is going to get us a long way. There's going to be some other, well, there's, there's things in here which we're going to have to talk about, like what it means to have this on polynomials, remainders on polynomials, but you know a little bit about that. OK, so let's just see. I'm just going to run this. Uh, I'm saying, OK, what's the GCD between 2 and 2 times 2? Is 2. What's the GCD between 3 times 7 and 6? 3. What's the GCD between 4 and 13? 1, right, because 13 is prime. That's a, almost what sort of can define a prime. Right? The GCDs of itself and anything else is, is uh, one besides itself. Um, don't use this one. Right? Use the inbuilt ones. Okay? So there is a GCD in base, which is going to be super fast. Um, and it's going to be equivalent to what we just wrote. Like, obviously, like, you shouldn't write things recursively. I'm glad my 3400 student left, because that whole class is about me teaching things recursive. But it's kind of wasteful, memory-wise. It creates a bunch of recursive stacks. You really want to take something like this and make it an in-place algorithm. But like, that's really for our software engineers to worry about. Um, just know that like, a lot of the things that we defined in math are done recursively. But then there's some software or engineering that we have to do to sort of like do recursion, but not recursively, if that makes any. Does it make, did you ever, ever heard like what an in-place? Did you do quicksort at all? Do you talk about in-place quicksort a little bit? It doesn't really, really matter, right? Just, just to say the reason that, the, that Julia isn't using this code, like what you say, well, isn't that the code? It works. Um, yeah, but we can write something much faster. And um, you want to put much more energy into the basics of your system um, because everything is going to call it. Okay, 
So we don't actually want to use GCD. We want to use something called the extended Euclidean algorithm, because what the extended Euclidean algorithm gives us are something called Bezu co coefficients. And this is, I think, really, this is what Euclid was doing. We don't, we don't really care about the GCD. What I care about are these Bezo coefficients, okay? Because these Bezo coefficients allow me to form linear combinations of the input, right? So here, if you give me A and B, it is possible to form a linear combination of A and B so that it is equal to their GCD. Or, or in, in other words, if you, if, we, if you give me A and B, it is possible to find S and T so that A times S plus B times T is equal to their GC, GCD. Again, it's, I can form a linear combination of the input to equal to the GCD. Why is this important? Well, this is very important. Um, suppose we're working in a ring. And or our, let's say, yeah, we're working in a ring, and I want to find the inverse of an element in that ring. How do you do it? OK, so I'm working mod 7. What's the inverse of 5? Well, OK, that's not, that's not wrong, right? You just multiply, you just keep adding 5 to itself until you hit 1. But there's a couple problems there. When do you stop? You sort of have to start identifying you're in a cycle, right? Um, so I don't know how to do that. So that's one problem. Two, it's wasteful, right? You, it, like even when you do converge on the, on the inverse, it may take forever. So the question is, is there a better way of finding inverses? Can anyone see where this is going? Okay, my assertion is that we can compute inverses using Bezos coefficients. And the true purpose of Euclid's algorithm, the extended one, is precisely for doing inversion mod residues of prime characteristic. And I'll show you how this is done. Okay, so first of all, just know that you can modify the, the GCD algorithm to, at the same time as computing the GCD, also compute the Bezos coefficients. We're not going to be overly concerned with that. If you want to find out more, like take a number theory class. But it's, it's, it's not that complicated. Just pick up a number theory textbook and, and, and read about it. So I'm just going to go through here. So now, um, not only are we getting the GCDs, we are getting these Bezo coefficients. So here, so 4 and 12, I can say that 4 times 1 plus 12 times 0 is 4. I can say uh, for 9 and 12 that 9 times negative 1 plus 12 times 1 is 3. Right, which happens to be G the GCD of 9 and 12. For 4 and 13, which is the important one, which is the one I want to study, here this tells us that 4 times minus 3 plus 13 times 1 is equal to 1. Okay, can anyone see why this is useful yet? Okay, I, I think so. I'll, I'll but see if that aligns with what I'm going to show next. Okay, so just first to let you know, don't use this. It's slow. Okay, use the inbuilt one for which a lot of energy has gone into optimizing. All right, so that would be base.gcdx. X is for extended, and you can see that we're getting the same output in both cases. Right, so if you want more information on the extended um, Euclidean algorithm, right, remember you can always just query Julia to get information about stuff. Okay, so. Oh, geez, I put that there. Inversion. So I want to, okay, let's see. Let's go back to here. Let's look at this for a bit. Okay, so I, I have 4 and I have 13. What happens if I take this whole equation and I take the whole thing mod 13? What happens? So on the left-hand side, we're going to have 4 times minus 3 plus 13 times 1 mod 13. So what happens to this? Gone. Zero. What's on the right-hand side? 1 mod 13. What does the, thi the expression now say? 4 times minus 3 is congruent to 1 mod 13. What did that do? That gave us the inverse of 4 mod 13. Right, so if I want the inverse of 4 mod 13, I just have to get the Bezos coefficients. And the Bezos coefficient on 4 is the inverse. Any questions regarding that? Because this is really cute. 
right? That this, this, can, this can do it, right? That getting these coefficients actually gives us inversion. Right? And inversion isn't a computationally easy problem, or it shouldn't be. Right? So I'll, I'm going to flesh this out more. But again, if we, if we look here and we just ask ourselves, what happens if we take this mod 13? This is gone, and it reports that 4 times minus 3 is 1 mod 13. And thereby, the inverse of 4 is minus 3, and the inverse of minus 3 is 4, mod 13. Right? Or minus 3 is 10. Right? So I'm saying the inverse of 4 is 10 mod 13. Can we confirm that? Um, so I'm saying the inverse of 4 is 10 mod 14. What's 4 times 10? 40. That's like the easy thing on the multiplication table. Uh, mod 13, well, 13 times 3 is 39. One left over, that's 1. All right, so we got inversion, which is pretty neat. OK, so going down to here, let's flush that out a bit more. So notice the extended Euclidean algorithm computes inverses Zm. This is important, right? So if you give me a non-zero element from a, a ring of prime characteristic, the extended GCD gives us these Bezo coefficients, right? So A times S uh, plus M times T is equal to GCD of A and M. I'm not sure why this changed to M. I think this has to do with the Chinese remainder theorem. If we take this entire expression mod m, this will disappear. Right, so that's what happened here. And we're left with the GCD of a and m is congruent to a times s mod m. And if we guarantee that this GCD is 1, then the extended Euclidean algorithm is determining inverses. How can I guarantee that the GCD of a and m is going to be 1? Pick a prime m. right? It has to be 1, right? That's the definition of a prime number. Sometimes people say, just make sure that m and a is coprime. That is technically true, but uh, you don't know what a is ahead of time, right? So just choose a prime, and that's going to work for any, for any that, that you can be given. So here's an example. So if the question is, find the inverse of 5 mod 13, I just say, OK, um, run the extended Euclidean algorithm on 5 and 13. You're going to get back the. Um, Bezo coefficients 1, minus 5, and 2. So this has sort of moved things around. This is the GCD. This is the Bezo coefficient on 5. And this is the Bezo coefficient on uh, 13. So this says that the inverse of 5 uh, mod 13 is minus 5. Does that make sense? What's minus 25 mod 13? Someone check on their computer. Well, we can see. What is uh, minus 5? mod 13. Oh, minus 5 squared. So it's 25. Oh, minus 25. Minus 12. OK, the co those, hold on. Which coefficients are which? Oh, sorry. Because like that has to be the GCD. So they've moved around these somehow. I think this should be the inverse, yeah. So something is going wrong. OK, let's try remainder. Um, minus 5 times 5, remainder 13. Oh, minus 12 is 1, 13. Yeah, sorry, I'm, just, I'm sort of losing it. OK, great, great. Um, but that's not what the symmetric mod would report in this case. right? You want that to be 1. right? This is why sort of moving between like the, the standard representatives of your residue class are important. Right, because I'd rather work with 1 than minus 12. OK, so there you go. We, we did genuinely find the inverse. We wrote this function for you called inverse mod, which effectively just pulls out the correct element. Right? So uh, if you want to find the inverse of a mod m, you just call this inverse mod, which is in your project. Uh, in this case, the inverse of 5 mod 13 is 8. I don't know. Something must have got changed. Uh, what is a and? Sorry. What is A and M here? 5 and 13. Like How am I hallucinating now? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, minus 5 is 8 mod 13. <laughs> Jesus Murphy. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, so it's all fine. I just have to make sure that we're like, this is why I probably should have like insisted on reporting everything as a positive in this case, just so I stop getting confused. But these numbers are all the same. Right? They're just, the, they're just, we have to standardize them somehow. And there's two ways of standardizing them, with negatives or, or without. But 8 is minus 5, right? So this is all working. OK, so five minutes. What I want to do 
Okay. So it's kind of weird because like things got moved around. So I need to discuss. Okay. I'm going to leave Chinese remainder theorem for next class right, because that's what Yanni wants me to do. What he, what he wanted me to explain to you is why. Have you looked at the project yet? Okay, so th some of the polynomial arithmetic functions that you're working with don't return polynomials. What are they returning? Someone already identified this on the ed stem. Okay, if you look at the function in the project that does division, it doesn't return a polynomial. It returns a function. And the function says, give me a prime number, and then I can, then I can actually give you the division. So the reason this is the case is that we can only start doing, we can only do the remainder algorithm on, the, on polynomials if the coefficient field is, if the coefficient ring is a field. Are the integers a field? No. Right? So that means I can only do division once you tell me what residue class I'm working in. And that's what the division uh, function is primed to do. It's saying, I've set it up, you give me a prime number, and then I, I will go ahead and uh, give, uh, respond to you with the polynomial. And the reason we had to do it is because of Chinese remainder theorem. So what Chinese remainder theorem allows us to do, do I have the slides still? Uh, so we play a game effectively, right? So I have a secret number. That secret number is you, okay? And you are allowed to ask me what the image of you is modulo anything you want. So you can go, what is u mod 7? What is u mod 13? What is u mod 21? You can do that as many times as you want. And the game becomes, can you reconstruct the original number from that information? And the answer is, yes, you can, right? And, I, and I'll flesh out that theorem. I'll give you bounds for uh, what the product of m's have to equal to in order to do this. But this is to say, in, we're going to give you a multiplication algorithm which utilizes Chinese remainder theorem in order to multiply. And that's going to require that you're able to take f times g and ask for results mod 3, mod 7, mod 11, mod You need to do the same operation for various amounts of prime numbers. So that's why we set up division the way that we did it. We don't want to say, oh, go set yourself, like assume that we're working mod 7. It's like, well, we can't. Because we're going to have to work in many different residue classes. Right? We, need to, we, we need to be able to look at f mod 3 and mod 5 and mod 7 and mod 11. Right? So the best way to do that, OK, I shouldn't say best. A way to do that was to have the division function report back a function which says, give me a prime, and then I will give you back the, back the result. That is, for our uses, that is a good interface. Now, one of the explicit homework problems is for you, do, do you know what an interface means? You talked a little bit about. The interface is effectively how you expect people to utilize the code that you're, write, you're writing. And at the moment, having division return functions isn't a very neat interface. I don't think users would expect something like that. So we actually asked you to clean up this interface by creating another type called mod p polynomial which somehow um, remembers the P that it's supposed to be using and hides that away from the user, right? So, because it would be better um, to have this sort of automated in the background, right? So that is explicitly one of your tasks. Okay, so what we did today is, was effectively just talk about the integers a bit, right? And how we can take some of them and still uh, be able to do things like addition, multiplication, and inversion. In fact, if we take a prime, num prime many number of integers, then we're guaranteed to be able to do inversion because that forms a field. Not only does it form a field because we have multiplication and inversion, it forms an integral domain because its multiplication never um, generates zeros that are unexpected. It's also a ring because we have multiplication which distributes over addition, which has um, multiplicative zero and multiplicative identity. And it also forms a group because we can add those things and the additions stay within the same field. And that addition also has a zero. What we're going to start doing next class is take all the things we did in this class on integers and do them for polynomials. Because my claim was that a polynomial is just a different way of representing an integer. So I want you to think about how, you know, 
Well, it should, addition you should be able to do. Multiplication you should be able to do. You've, all, you've done this on paper and pencil. So maybe what I want you to think about is, well, when you're doing your paper and pencil deductions or arithmetic, think about what you're actually doing. Right? Think about if you can actually codify the steps into a generic method for multiplying two things together and see if you can take that to, to division. So we'll do that next class. And then next week, I will present to you the factoring algorithm, which is incredible. Um, so see you tomorrow for one hour. OK. Oh, bye, chat. Thanks for coming. Sorry about all the technical difficulties. Sorry I ignored you the whole time. Yes, you may. Yes, yes, yes. How would you do that since you can't represent them as the roots of a They're e and pi. Okay. And then, you just and then we tell them. other functions what their values are in the relevant settings. Okay. Well, what is E? E does have its, E is a Taylor series yeah. expansion, right? So. I was wondering if that's how Maple represents it. I'm not actually sure what it represents it by, but that's the core philosophy. It's like, yeah. these aren't numbers. Even thinking of them as numbers is, is, is yeah. wrong out of the gate. The, these, are, these are things way. that have properties. Yeah. Like, the property generates the number. The number doesn't generate yeah. the property. Like, what's pi? And like, well, that's the circumference of the unit circle. Yeah. Is that correct? That's a circumference of, of a, it's a half the circumference of a, a, a unit circle. It's the area of a unit circle. OK, yes. Um, but like that is definitionally what it is. Yeah, um, okay. right? So why like, de associate it with its true meaning? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah, it, it does make sense when you're starting like, like, give me 100 digits of a pi. It's like, why? Who cares? Like, that's, you only want digits of pi to get more accurate computations that involve pi. But okay, why don't we just know that sine of pi is like zero? Like yeah. we we just know that, right?